Welcome in to Daily Faceoff Live, your go-to source for everything hockey, live every weekday at noon Eastern. Welcome in to a fresh week of Daily Faceoff Live. Tyler Uramchuk and our Daily Faceoff NHL insider Frank Saravalli with you for 25 minutes of straight hockey talk. Frank, how was your weekend? It was good. Stanley Cup final, game one in the books. Busy, some coaching hirings, chasing some other stories that haven't quite uh, come to light yet on the coaching hiring and firing trail. We'll get to that shortly. All right, well, let's dig into it today's show. As always, brought to you by Botano. The game starts now at Botano.ca. Frank, let's start with some breaking news on a Monday. Earlier this morning, it was announced that the Montreal Canadiens have locked up their future star winger, Cole Caulfield. I mean, the guy scored at a nearly 40 goals per 82 game pace through his young NHL career, but with injuries and other things, he hasn't hit the 150 game mark yet. Still, the Habs go and give him an eight-year deal worth $7.85 million, just a hair below the AAV they gave their captain, Nick Suzuki. My take on it, Frank, is I love when teams do this. We know the cap will eventually start jumping up a lot every summer, and that'll just make deals like Caulfield and Suzuki more and more of, as you'd say, bargoons for the Habs. What do you make of them locking up Caulfield? Yeah, I love this deal. And it, what was so fascinating to me, Tyler, was to see the push and pull on social media. Tweet the terms of the deal, eight years times 785, and everyone's all of a sudden exploding. This is the most bipolar contract extension I've ever seen. Half of the audience is saying, what an overpayment for this little guy who's been injured already to this point in his NHL career. And the other half are saying, this is an absolute steal, a team-friendly deal. It's so weird to see the two polls because you would think, well, if that is indeed the case of both of uh, these sides saying two opposite things, that does that mean that the Montreal Canadiens got it right? Not only do I think they got it right, I think it's an absolute home run for the Habs. You consider where this cap is heading. We're going to be playing at an $100 million a year salary cap before this deal is halfway old. And so you've now purchased the very best years of Cole Caulfield's career from age 22 to essentially 30, maybe uh, 31 he turns by the end of it. Mm -hmm. That's a great buy for a guy that has produced the way that he has, particularly since Marty St. Louis took over. 19 goals in the last 37 games that he played of Marty St. Louis' first year as Canadiens head coach. And then you take a look at the production that he had this past season, 26 goals in 46 games, which was a lost year for almost every Canadian, given that the injuries that they all face. So, yeah, has there been some bad luck there? Is there some risk with Caulfield uh, given his size and given the injury factor? Yeah, but that's not really a risk for the Montreal Canadiens because, for one, that contract will be insured, and two – Knowing where this cap is heading, he's going to be essentially being paid second line money pretty soon for what could be a 40. And I don't think he's capped at 40 goal scorer. I think this guy can be a 50 goal scorer in short order. Yeah, we saw the graphic 26 goals in 46 games last year. If, if he was healthy, he pops home 40 on a Habs team that wasn't even that good, right? So, I mean, really interesting deal. You think about the final three, four years about that deal and the Suzuki deal. You could have two absolute studs, top line players locked up for what, like 12% of your salary cap. I think this is just what smart teams do. Uh, quickly, before we move on, what else do you think the Habs could get up to this summer? Or now that they've spent all their money, are they just kind of set to run with this group next year? They need to improve their back end. They haven't spent all their money, 82 and change million bucks. And you're forgetting that they have the carry price deal that they can mm -hmm. put on LTIR. So that knocks oh, them yeah. down a bit. So they have space. They, they, they need to figure out long-term, big picture, 30,000 foot view, how to fix their goaltending long-term. Sam Montembeau coming off of Great Worlds. But how do you improve the back end? You can get the goalie, but if you don't have the defenseman, and I think they've got the depth defenseman part of it solved. Uh, you see someone like an Arbor Jack guy, for instance, those types of guys, perfect, you know, five, six, seven defensemen. But you need the upper echelon, the ones and twos that are so hard to come by. Um, that's really where they need to dig in. And, and they've got some exciting pieces on the way up front, of course. Um, I, I think this Montreal Canadiens forward core is a lot better than most would realize. And I think if they get the right pieces defensively, 
they could be knocking on the door of the playoffs a lot sooner Ooh. than you might think. Love it. Let's move along to what we saw over the weekend, and we'll start on the ice where the Vegas Golden Knights won 5-2 in the opener in the opener of the Stanley Cup final. And there were a few interesting takeaways from this one, Frank, but the one that really stood out to me for the first time in, what, four, five, six weeks, Sergei Bobrovsky looked human as the Golden Knights score five goals on their way to coming out to a one nothing series lead in the Stanley Cup final. Since the NHL went to the best-of-seven format, 76% of teams that win game one go on to win the Stanley Cup. A two-parter for you. What stood out to you in game one, and what do the Panthers need to do moving forward to get back into this series? Well, there's a few things that stood out to me from the Panthers' perspective. I can actually answer both questions in one shot. One, they lost the chaos battle in front of the net. Um, they, they didn't create nearly enough in front of Aiden Hill compared to what the Golden Knights did in front of Sergei Bobrovsky. You see the two goals from defensemen and the way that they were scored with screens and traffic. Uh, that's something they can easily do better. Two, I think they lost their cool a bit, as evidenced by Matthew Kachuk and the sort of punch of an unsuspecting opponent there in the last five minutes of the game. Um, he gets tossed essentially ruining any chance that they had an authentic chance to come back in that game surprised that really wasn't talked about more given what he means to the team and you know you, you just compare that to other players in the past losing their cool and nazim cat we'd be talking about that for a week why not the same for matthew kachuk uh they need him to be better and frankly he wasn't very good or wasn't nearly as um a, much of a force in game one as the florida panthers need him to be um, and then I would say, um, you know, when you look at this Panthers team overall, like settle down, you heard Paul Maurice say after the game, just bleep and breathe. That's what everyone needs to do. The atmosphere was electric in Vegas. Um, you know, you see those types of things. They were able to play a feisty game that is kind of rare for a game one of a Stanley cup final for two teams that only meet twice a year. Um, there was a lot of fire and emotion into that game. And what I would say for the Panthers is they were, uh, you know, a, a bounce here or there away from taking game one. Five, two is not what that game would indicate. They actually played pretty well. If they had one game one, Tyler, we're having a totally different discussion. They're playing with house money. They won a game that they probably should not have given the 10 day layoff. And that just tells you how close this is. That said, they have to win game two, in my opinion. I don't think really? they can win four of five against the Vegas team that's been incredibly consistent all playoffs long. Yeah, and that's a good point. I always like to say you're never in trouble till you lose at home, but considering the magnitude of a Stanley Cup final, winning four or five against this Vegas team would be tough. Also, Mike McKenna would kill me if I did not give Aiden Hill some love for this remarkable stop. Frank, you compare it to last time when the Golden Knights were in the final and Brayden Holtby doing pretty much the same thing in the same net to the Vegas Golden Knights, helping the Washington Capitals win the Cup. I wonder if a couple weeks from now we'll be looking back at this Aiden Hill save in a very similar way because it came at an absolutely huge moment in that hockey game. Golden Knights, they are 2-0 and in franchise history in game ones of the Stanley Cup final. Problem is they're 0-4 after that. So let's see if they can do things a little bit differently this time around. I was there at that game in 2018 to witness this save by Holpe. I wrote about it after the game even though they lost the game. Um, but that save ended up propelling Hopi and the Caps onto yeah. the cup. Let's move along to some off-ice news that we got over the weekend. Commissioner Gary Bettman doing his pre-Stanley Cup final media avail. And a handful of interesting things I'll throw you away, Frank. But first, Bettman seemed adamant the Stanley Cup is, or sorry, the salary cap is not going up more than $1 million this summer. Can you explain why this makes any sense? Well, it doesn't to me yet. And to me, what I read through that is Gary Bettman throwing red meat at the players, seeing if they're going to seize on it. It's a negotiating tactic. Um, the NHL and the NHLPA met last week or 10 days ago, I believe, in New York. Um, I, I do think one of the things that they talked about was a potential $3 million increase in the cap for this summer. Not decided yet, not done the NHL, of course, is asking for an increase in the escrow caps, which are already negotiated as part of the salary cap and, and formula for the next couple of years. Um, 
I don't see the NHLPA budging on that, but I do think that there's a compromise to be had and a way to increase this cap moving forward. So um, I, I still am holding out hope that it will change. I don't accept for one second that this is a done deal and the cap's only increasing by a million. Uh, the commissioner and uh, Bill Daly as well, sorry, talking about the Valeri Nachushkin incident in uh, that happened in Seattle during the Avalanche's playoff run. They say he's eligible to play, and they they said it was handled properly, to paraphrase it. Uh, but is there maybe something the Avalanche need to do in this situation? Yeah, address it. The fact that Valeri Nachushkin left the team under murky circumstances, to say the least. Um, they said it wasn't a discipline issue. They said it wasn't uh, a health issue. Quite clearly, based on the body cam footage and the reporting from the Seattle Times would indicate that Valeri Nichushkin was also intoxicated in that room. Uh, by what? We don't know. Uh, but the fact that the league says that they won't be disciplining and, and the fact that they think the Avalanche have done this right doesn't mean that they still don't need to address it. You can't just show on, up in September at training camp and, oh, everything's good here, blowing off a skate morning skate during the playoffs and being under the influence on a game day is certainly something that needs addressing. And hopefully we'll get some answers on that. And quickly, before we move along, there was a little bit of like expansion stuff and Arizona Coyotes talk as well. Did any of that stand out to you or was it more or less exactly what you expected to hear? I uh, did expect to hear that the NHL is continuing to review options in Phoenix. In fact, I'm told downtown Phoenix is where the focus is working out some kind of arrangement uh, with the Phoenix Suns and their new ownership group uh, about either renovating that arena and the ice plant that's in there, although not perfect because the Coyotes already played there to start their tenure in Arizona, uh, that that's certainly something that uh, they're talking about at this exact moment in time. One of the few options that they're considering, I was curious to hear Gary Bettman say that he felt like uh, that they're better able to withstand now than 20 years ago, the idea of this team relocating. I don't necessarily buy that. And you finally heard from Marty Walsh, the new NHLPA executive director, saying uh, in with reporters after the, the Betton press conference that they need answers. And as soon as the NHLPA shows some teeth here, finally, I think is when we'll begin to get some answers. And one other quick thing, uh, the commissioner did, or deputy commissioner did say that uh, the report has been completed on the Team Canada 2018 World Junior Championship team and the sexual assault from the gala that they had for players. Not really anything new, except that they're hoping to have some punishment and or resolution by the summer. Um, we also heard way back before the season started that the report was, quote, substantially complete then. The fact that this dragged through an entire season and there wasn't any discipline, certainly I raise an eyebrow at that. One more piece of news to get to before we get to the All-32 for today, and it was the news that Mike Babcock is back. Frank Darren Dreger, the first to report that the Columbus Blue Jackets are going to name Mike Babcock as the team's next head coach. They're going to wait until the end of the month for when his contract with the Toronto Maple Leafs is officially up, and yourself and Jason Greger talked about the logic behind that a little bit on the DFO Rundown, which released yesterday. To me, I'm looking at this higher as, one, potentially the last shot for Yarmo Kekalainen to get things on track in Columbus. And also a bit of a boomer bust hire, Frank. I think if Mike Babcock, who hasn't coached in quite some time now, if he shows he's changed his ways a little bit, it can add in some more new school elements to his philosophy, then, hey, maybe this works and Columbus gets back into pushing for a playoff spot. But this feels like one of those moves where if it goes sour, it's going very sour very quickly. What do you make of this decision? Yeah, I don't know about quickly. It sounds like it's a four-year deal for Mike Babcock. And I think it speaks, as you said, to the emphasis that the Blue Jackets are placing on this hire. This is Yarmo Kekalainen's last stand. He has to get this right. I'm surprised that there wasn't more heat or pressure on his tenure, especially after spending $80 million bucks last summer. Um, so a significant offseason for the Blue Jackets that resulted in them finishing in the bottom five of the league. And I know injuries and things happen, but that can't be the only explanation for why this team hasn't had any sort of you know, measurable success at any real juncture. They've won one series in franchise history and lost to the Bruins in a year that they loaded up and everyone was saying, oh, look how great it is that Columbus did something. 
So this is a significant juncture for the, the Blue Jackets to arrive to. And I also think it's a significant juncture for Mike Babcock as well. You consider um, four years out of the game for one of the most accomplished coaches of his generation. I call him the Tiger Woods for NHL coaches because he significantly raised everyone's payday much in the same way Tiger Woods did for every pro golfer. Coaches are paid now routinely $5 million plus based on Mike Babcock and his precedent setting contract, which by the way, he's making the Toronto Maple Leafs pay every last red cent on. And I think it's fascinating because what has he learned in the meantime? We all heard the, the allegations of improper treatment of players, the sort of mental warfare that he had on players. He's admitted that he made mistakes. I also think it's dangerous to judge him and say he's a bad person. Being a hockey coach is not the same as being a paper pusher in an office working nine to five. It's a different set of uh, standards and tactics, different language, all those different things. It's not a normal workplace. So adding all those things up, what new tricks will he have learned, if any? And if not, is it going to be the same Mike Babcock? I doubt it. He's a pretty smart guy. I would have to think he's evolved. Three more open slots. Three more open coaching spots. That you know of. Anything? Well, or are you teasing say, for a future show? No, I'm not teasing for a future show, but two places that aren't on this board are the Toronto Maple Leafs, and we don't have any firm decision yet, although we expect Sheldon Keefe to be back. And what happens with a new ownership group in Ottawa with DJ Smith? So there's two more potential moves. Mm. And what I was working on over the weekend was the New York Rangers, the third team on that list. Nothing official to this point yet, but I think there's lots of speculation over the weekend, especially after the Memorial Cup, that the Rangers will reach out at some point to Patrick Waugh to speak to him. Chris Drury and Waugh, of course, former teammates. That hasn't happened yet to my knowledge. Um, and the Rangers did speak to John Hines late last week as well. Uh, and had a formal interview after seeking permission from the Preds. So there's the BU connection between John Hines and Chris Drury as well, played together for three seasons at BU. So I don't want to say it's down to a two-horse race, because I think that's oversimplifying it, but um, I would expect now that the Mem Cup has been handed out and Patrick Waz added yet another ridiculous trophy to his, uh, to his case and collection, um, that there will be interest and in maybe not just from the Rangers. Maybe some more on that tomorrow. We're running a little behind, so let's get to this week's edition of The All 32. This week's edition of The All 32 is brought to you by UFC 289. Coming up this Saturday on at Pay-Per-View, Nunez versus Aldana. And six Canadians on the card. It's all happening at Rogers Arena in Vancouver. So let's head out to Vancouver and talk some Canucks. Satcha from Sportsnet 650. Always a pleasure to welcome you into the show. And as we dissect what the Canucks could get up to this offseason, I think it all kind of starts with, how are they going to open up some cap space? Could it be a buyout? Are they attaching assets to bad contracts? Could it be a big trade involving someone like JT Miller sat? What do you think is the most likely route that Rutherford and company take here? I mean, I think it's obvious it's going to be trade. They're not going to be buying anybody out, especially not a big contract. It doesn't look like right now unless something, you know, significantly changes over the next little while. So I'd say it's going to be a trade. But what I find fascinating, and I know, Frank, we've been talking about this, you know, at length every single week on our station. I know you talk about it on DFO cast. And I understand your skepticism. How are they going to make the deals they want to make? And I wonder if the goal of trying to move cap space might be the one they don't do. So do we see some more trades and i know we threw this by you the the other week but do they trade maybe a garland or a besser for a center or a defenseman who's a third pair of defenseman third line center type of deal that type of a move might be more realistic unless somehow some way some team see some value in a player like connor garland but given the winger market and given what we're seeing around the league with, with a flat cap world it seems like the price for the canucks to move off salary is going to be onerous so i wonder if their goal to clear cap space is going to become more of a goal of trying to make trades and find players to fit spots instead of clearing the money. Yeah. It's just fascinating to see what they end up doing sad. And I've talked to you about this, as you mentioned on 650, the idea of trading Garland and him being at the forefront of that. Um, but my question for you is let's, let's park the cap talk for a moment mm -hmm. and, and contracts. 
my focus on the Canucks and really improving into a playoff team next year really revolves around what they do on their back end. What, what do you see just maybe not so much in terms of a name, but functionally, what do they need on their defense core to really improve? Well, in terms of names, it really depends on how much money they can clear, right? But it's very obvious they're looking for a guy that can kill penalties to some degree, right? So their PK was a, a complete abomination this past year. Not only do they need a center to take some draws, they need a penalty-killing defenseman as well, whether it's a lefty or a righty, because you can't be throwing Quinn Hughes out there 27 minutes a game, right? So I think they need somebody to play a, a role like that, which in theory is a lot easier to add. It's easier to add a player who – maybe it's a third pair guy that can give you a little bit of defensive value, some PK value. And it shouldn't cost you an, an exorbitant amount of uh, assets to go and acquire, but it comes back to how much money that you have, right? I think in an ideal world, if they clear some money, they can go out and perhaps sign somebody to a cheap contract, come out and do that. But are you forced to maybe look at a trade where you're moving again, moving a contract out for a Marcus Pedersen type, a guy that brings certain value, maybe can play a certain role alongside of um, whether it's Heronic, whether it's somebody else on the, on the team, but in terms of them trying to get somebody meaningful, like we talked about before, how do you add money to a blue line that has 7.25 going to Oliver ekman Larson, 6 million going to Tyler Myers? Oh, no, by the way, you got to pay Philip Peronic more than 4 million after next season if he's going to be here long term. So, how eight do you add? To eight. Probably it, all right? Seven to eight. I mean, seven's the low end, the high end's eight and a half, depending on what type of season he has, right? So, we're talking about a big salary here. So, how do you add to the books unless you get money off the books? Myers eventually is going to go. He has one year left on his contract. But I wonder if as much as Vancouver has this grand plan of perhaps adding a top four defenseman, adding a third line center, do you have to kind of settle for make, you know, kind of just band-aiding it over for a year, finding somebody for a year until the, until the cap space opens up? And I wonder if what we see from Vancouver is maybe a, a more along the lines of what we saw last year where they make two or three trades that set up something else down the road, right? Maybe you take make a trade to take a bit of a loss, like the Dickinson one, allow them to go out and make the Ethan Bear trade, allow them to do other things potentially. So you pay a price, and then over two or three or five or six months, you're able to make that back. But everything's kind of in a holding pattern for Vancouver until they can clear some money out. And what I find interesting is on Tyler Myers, can they work out a deal with somebody and say, we'll pay the bonus in September, We'll make the trade official on September 2nd or 3rd or whatever it is, but we'll have this in our back pocket. We see that in the NBA a lot. It doesn't quite happen in hockey as much. So I wonder if that's something that we'd see in hockey. We see in the NBA all the time. Team makes a trade. They wait three months for it to be made official because of salary cap issues, and that's completely on board and everything is fine. Typically doesn't happen in hockey, but I wonder if Vancouver tries to work something like that out, and that way they know they can go over the cap by a few million and find a way to get that money off the books in September. So, Sad, I actually wanted to ask a follow-up because I was wondering about the idea of that Myers deal. Are they Would they be cutting off their nose to spite their face at that point, given the mandate that they want to try and be a playoff team next year? You know, this is – people already look at this defense core as one that's thin. Mm -hmm. You take a guy like Myers out of the lineup and also probably is if you, if you fall short of expectations – a really valuable trade deadline piece, given exactly what you just mentioned, that the bonus will have already been paid. It's almost like you lose two ways. Yeah. Well, and that's the issue where Vancouver finds itself, right? Eventually, they're going to have to take a loss, right? It's either you pay an asset to get rid of money now, or you punt on a player who could be an asset in the two or three months. And the other guy, I think, who fits a similar mold, obviously not as onerous and doesn't have the bonus coming to him, is Anthony Bevilier as well. You can probably move him now, maybe give up something, maybe not a lot, but you get the money off your books. But come the deadline, let's say he's on pace for 50 points. Let's say he's on pace for 20 goals. He's probably getting you a second plus at the deadline. He's the type of player teams will be after. So do you punt on getting assets in six or seven months versus trying to make your moves today? And that's why I wonder maybe the best move you can do, and I know it's not fun or sexy, but sign a couple of cheap guys, just patch it over a little bit, and then try to make some trades during the season. Because I don't subscribe to the theory of, you have to hold on to your guys if you're in a playoff spot. I think that's complete bunk. I think just looking at things in a, in a, in a uh, one-way type of aspect. And we see it all the time. Smart hockey teams. We saw with the Leafs didn't quite work out, but they traded a pure angle ball, created space to make other moves. They could, in theory, Vancouver, move a Myers, move a Bavilia at the deadline, get some assets back, and maybe make a longer-term play for somebody at the deadline and still be in a playoff spot. So I think having the flexibility and the actual assets is the most important thing. But it comes down to Vancouver's true desire to hit the ice, you know, skating fast next season. And if that's an organizational plan, maybe they're willing to pay a little extra to make that happen. 
But that hasn't really been their MO, generally speaking, outside of the Dickinson trade, which they were forced to do because they were up against the cap when the season was about to begin a couple of days later. But I think that's kind of something that we're going to have to keep in mind here for Vancouver. As much as they're trying and, and they want to do a lot of different things, to your point, I don't think they want to cut off their nose to spite their own face. And if you look at it logically, there is a way for two or three of their players to become better assets as the season goes on, as opposed to trying to dump them today. The All-32 brought to you by UFC 289 happening out in Vancouver this Saturday and happening in your living room on the pay-per-view broadcast. Always a pleasure to chat with you, Sat. Thanks for hopping on. Thanks, guys. Anytime. Frank, crumple up the inbox question we had prepped. Throw it in the garbage. We have breaking news. The Anaheim Ducks have named a new head coach. It is Greg Cronin getting the gig. What do you make of this hire? Yeah, so I had a feeling that they talked to Greg Cronin over the last uh, probably while ago now. The Ducks have been at this for like six weeks. And they have um, I, I made the joke on, on Twitter the other day that they talked to 468 people mm-hmm. like, They did not leave any stone unturned in their search, uh, Pat Verbeek. And so Greg Cronin, if you could take Pat Verbeek's intensity and the way that he goes about that job sort of laser focused, that's a lot of what Greg Cronin is on the bench. And he spent a long time already as an NHL assistant, um, like 10 seasons worth of time. Yeah between um, the Islanders and the Maple Leafs uh, has, you know, of course the last five years as an AHL head coach. So someone that has experience, um, I think some people might be surprised that the name uh, 60 years old, just now finally getting his first shot as an NHL head coach. But I like that the ducks are doing something a little bit different. You've got a team that's going to be rebuilding for the next couple of years. You need a coach that can develop and that's their big focus getting someone who has developed players in the AHL. Yeah. An interesting hire. And now there are only two vacant spots for for now, now. for now. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, Let's move along to our Botano daily bets. The game starts now at Botano game two starts tonight between the Panthers and golden Knights. And can Florida bounce back is the question. I don't know, Frank. And honestly, I don't even love the value on them potentially bouncing back. So I'm sticking with the props for this hockey game. And I actually have three of them that I think are good value in this one. The first is an Anthony Duclair point. It's paying plus 115. He's having a very good playoffs and he scored a goal last game for the Panthers. So plus money on Duclair to just get on the score sheet, not score a goal. I love that one. Also, Riley Smith is close to plus money. It's minus 105. I think that's a good spot. He also scored in that series opener. So close to even money on Smith, plus 125 on Duclair to put up at least one point and uh, also a shot prop for this one. Mark Stone's line is set at two and a half and it's paying plus 110. You're giving me plus money on this. He had seven in game one. He's probably not doing seven again, but betting on him to just get at least three in game two of this Stanley Cup final with the Golden Knights once again on home ice. I think there's a couple really nice plus money spots here on this game, and it's all available over at Batano. The game starts now at Batano.ca. And that brings us to garbage time. Frank, you can stay on the bench for this one. I'm jumping in here. Patrick Waugh leads the Quebec Remparts to a Memorial Cup championship, a new kind of ring plugging his ears, some would say. Um, A really interesting run here. Like We had a question in the YouTube chat from Cedric about the Seattle Thunderbirds kind of flaming out, even though they had what a lot of people were calling the super team of the tournament, but a really interesting run to the Memorial Cup for the Quebec Remparts. I loved seeing Patrick Waugh hugging his players, getting doused with the blue Gatorade on the ice after the game and the videos back home in Quebec in Quebec City of their watch party just going nuts. I thought it was great. Um, anyways, what did you make of Patrick Waugh winning the uh, Memorial Cup? And what, what do you think's the percent chance he's back with the Remparts next year? Uh, I would say like a 25% chance. I do think that there's a real good opportunity for him somewhere in the NHL. Those spots now, of course, dwindling, but man, what a, what an absolute serial winner. I mean, think of all the things that this guy has won three Vezina trophies, five Jennings trophies. How many Stanley cups? Oh, four, three con smites to win the Quebec uh, Major Junior Championship, now the Mem Cup as coach. He's also got a Jack Adams. 
He's also won a Calder Cup. Like, this guy has won everything humanly possible. So to think that he has a Jack Adams at the NHL level, has now won again back in junior, doing it a different way, that he's not ready for another NHL opportunity. I think he's hungry and chomping at the bit. We'll see if the Rangers call it. See if that phone rings today for Patrick Waugh. Oh, that would be just an awesome fit when you think about the personality of Patrick Waugh in that market. It'd be great. Uh, we're going to talk about coaching vacancies and a whole lot more. A full recap of Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Final tomorrow as well. Thanks to everyone who tuned in on the YouTube. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button before you go. Big shout out to Sat Shaw for joining us in the All 32 as well. That's a wrap on today's edition of Daily Face Off Live. We'll talk again tomorrow at noon Eastern. Thanks for tuning in to Daily Face Off Live. Make sure you hit the subscribe button to never miss an episode.